Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Wonderful to see you all. Some friendly, familiar faces. It's really good to be, to be back and to see you all again. If you open your Bibles with me to Proverbs chapter 1, we'll be in Proverbs this morning. We're going to cover a small section in Proverbs 1, verse 20 to 33. And as you turn there, let me ask you this question. Have you ever experienced this before? Being busy doing something, maybe you're writing an email or you're doing something, you're working on a project, fully engrossed in an activity, and somebody talks to you, but you hear absolutely nothing of what they say to you. You're so fully engaged in what you're doing that the words go in one ear and straight out the other side, and you're forced to say, these humbling words. I'm sorry, I I just wasn't listening. Has it happened to you before? Husbands? Right? (laughs) Isn't it amazing how we can hear something without actually hearing it at all? The audio waves hit our eardrums, but nothing actually registers inside our minds and inside our hearts. It's as if we never really heard in the first place. This morning in Proverbs 1, Lady Wisdom is making her call, and she is calling us to listen. This is the call of wisdom. Lady Wisdom says, listen to me. I'm making a call to you. Open your ears to me. Actually hear what I'm saying to you. This is the call of wisdom that we look at in Proverbs 1 this morning. Before we jump in, let's ask the Lord for His help in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. It guides us, it leads us. It's a light to our path. Father, I pray that there would be no one in this room this morning that does not hear your word. I pray, Father, that you would grant us soft hearts and ears that are ready to listen. I pray there would be no one who disregards your call to wisdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to break this down into three, uh, and our first point here is the wisdom's call from verse 20 to 23. Wisdom's call. Let's read at this passage. Look at verse 20. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing, and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. This is wisdom's call. And really, as you read the book of Proverbs, the first nine chapters have the sense of urgency, kind of like a a street preacher a fiery street preacher, preaching with a sense of earnestness. If you look at the, the context there, it's, it's King Solomon talking to his son, trying to impart words of wisdom, really pleading with his son to listen to wisdom rather than foolishness. And that's a, that's a picture that all of us can identify with, a father talking to a son, a father imparting wisdom to a son, A parent giving wise advice to one of their children. There's a sense of earnestness there. The father wants the son to know. The father wants the son to listen and to understand and to obey and to believe. A great sense of urgency. And we'll see that right through our passage this morning. Great sense of urgency. Listen to how wisdom is personified. I love how the author does this. Because if we talk about wisdom in an an abstract sense, it'll be hard for us to understand what is being said. But if we say that wisdom is a lady and she's standing at a street corner calling out, we can all picture that, we can all understand that. We understand the the dynamic there, We, we can see what's going on there. So look at verse 20. This is Lady Wisdom calling out. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. 
There's emphasis here. These are places of commerce, trade, centers of activity, daily living. Solomon is saying here, you need wisdom in every tiny part of your life, in your daily living, a day-to-day thing. This is not just a, a, a one point in the future you might need some wisdom, or at some point in your life you might need to be wise and to listen to these words. This is a daily thing. In the markets, Lady Wisdom raises her voice. At the head of a noisy, bustling, busy street, where all the people are going by, and they're busy engaged in their activities and their trade, and the worries of the day. Wisdom is just on the corner there, crying out, listen to me, listen to my voice. At the entrance of the city gate, where people are coming and going, she speaks. So who is Lady Wisdom? What is it that Solomon is talking about here? Is it just some general advice? Good tips on how to live well? Solomon's wisdom to his son? This will unfold soon. But ultimately, let's understand this. Wisdom is not just a a set of ideas to be followed. The fullness of wisdom, we know now, is a person. Jesus Christ. That's the fullness of wisdom. And the consequences for accepting and rejecting wisdom, God's wisdom, have consequences both here and in eternity. 1 Corinthians 1.24 says this, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. It's helpful for us to bear that in mind as we go through this. Christ is the embodiment and the fulfillment of the wisdom in Proverbs. It's as if the Lord himself is calling you. Listen to my my words. Listen to my voice. Look at verse 22. Look at what Lady Wisdom is saying here. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing? And fools hate knowledge. In other words, Lady Wisdom is saying, don't stay where you are. Don't remain in this place of loving being simple and delighting in your scoffing and hating knowledge. Don't stay there. Move along. Listen to wisdom. Listen to this great call that wisdom is making. Look at these words of affection that are in this verse 22. Simple ones who love being simple. Scoffers delighting in their scoffing. Fools hating knowledge. It's really about where your affections are, where your heart is aiming at. And there are really three people that are mentioned here in verse 22. Three groups or categories of people that Lady Wisdom is calling to. And I like to think of them almost as if there are three people in a boat sailing down a small river, but at the end you can see the deadly waterfall. And these three people in the boat are sailing along, unaware of what's going to happen to them, and Lady Wisdom is on the side of the riverbank, calling out, listen to me, listen to my voice. Inside the boat we have firstly the simple in verse 22. The simple, those who are just coasting along, no sense of urgency, why listen to wisdom? Why listen to what God has to say? No, no care for, for wisdom. The second person in that boat is a scoffer. A person with a hardened heart. Malicious intent. Hears the words of wisdom but rejects it. That's not for me. I won't listen to wisdom. And then thirdly, the fool. You'll find the fool all through Proverbs. Proverbs. And the fool is in this boat. The fool has a stubborn heart and follows his own ways rather than wisdom. So to all three of these people, Lady Wisdom is calling out, listen to my voice. Look at what she says in verse 23. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. I think the concept of repentance is embedded here in this verse. If you turn, if you turn from your own ways, if you accept 
wisdom's call. If you recognize, I'm not wise, I need God's wisdom. Look at what Lady Wisdom says in verse 23. If you turn or if you repent at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I think this is a, a spirit of wisdom, like a, like a gushing stream that will be poured out to you. I will make my words known to you. Divine revelation. God making himself known to you. John 6, 63, Jesus says these words. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The words that Jesus has spoken to us, the revelation that we have from God all throughout Scripture is spirit and life for us. So the scene is set here. Lady Wisdom is making her urgent call to us to listen to turn at her reproof. Let's move on now to wisdom's warning. Verses 24 to 31. Wisdom's warning. This is fascinating. In Scripture, it's actually a, a chiastic structure, which means it's kind of like a hamburger. You have multiple layers, two buns on the outside, layers of lettuce, and then this nice juicy patty in the middle. The focus, the emphasis is on the middle. So you actually see some repetition in these verses. Look at verse 24 and 25. Because I've called to you and you refuse to listen, I've stretched out my hand and no one has heeded, because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. Bounce down quickly to verse 29. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel, despised all my reproof. That's the outside. It's as if the author is saying, hey, heads up here. The consequences that I'm about to lay out here have solid grounds. There is a reason for these really terrifying and tragic consequences that are in the middle. These very serious, weighty consequences from verse 26 to 28. But before we get there, let's just read about what, what is happening, what's going on here. This is a tragic rejection of wisdom. Look at verse 24. Wisdom is saying essentially... I've called you, and you've ignored me. You've heard my words, and you've done nothing. Look at verse 24. Because I have called to you, and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand, and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel, and would have none of my reproof. There's a sense of lady wisdom saying, I've... I've tried to reach you. I've tried to lay out this pathway of wisdom before you, but you've rejected it. You've turned your back against it. You've ignored my counsel. You would have none of my reproof. Contrast that quickly with, with the believer, the one who believes in God and loves God. Hebrews 12, 5 says this, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Discipline is a loving thing when it's for the believer and it's for a purpose and the believer turns back to God. But this is quite the opposite here. This reproof, this chastisement has been ignored completely. It's as if really there's a parallel in Romans where these people are building up judgment for themselves. They are ignoring wisdom over and over again. Over and over again. Romans 2 verse 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Same idea here. Wisdom is calling out, but is being rejected over and over again. Let's look now at these terrifying consequences in the middle, this middle of this chiastic structure. Look at verse 26. These are weighty words. 
I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Look at these terrifying images that are used here. Calamity. Terror striking you. There's the idea here of those worst nightmares that you've been having that you wish would never, ever, ever come true. Have come true. Will come true. When terror strikes you like a storm, calamity comes like a whirlwind. Who's ever been outside when a lightning bolt strikes very, very close by? Happened to me recently. I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. That's the picture here. Terror striking like a storm, calamity like a whirlwind, distress and anguish coming upon you. These are all the consequences of rejecting wisdom, of turning your back against God. How do we understand this? How do we interpret this? I think, I think there are two senses here. I think there's, a, there's an application we can make for the here and the present, for now, and then a a more fuller application for the final day when we will meet God one day, the day of judgment. Think of the here and now, today. Think of the person who consistently rejects wisdom, rejects God's word and good advice and good counsel. For example, think of the alcoholic. After years of refusing counsel and advice, after years of turning his back on wisdom and choosing his own way instead, that person loses everything. Loses house, loses job, loses family, loses children. And all of those things will not return to him, no matter how much he cries out. Those are the consequences of consistently rejecting wisdom. And then the more fuller sense, the day of judgment. If you turn your back on God, there will come a day where he will turn his back on you and say, they will seek me, but they will not find me. The time will be too late. Time would have run out, and I will turn my back on them. They will cry out to me, but I will say, I will not listen to you because you refused me. Think for yourself this morning, which pathway are you on? What's your trajectory if you keep going in the way that you have been going think about all of last year continue to do the same thing this year where will it lead you closer to God more dependence on him more love for him more obedience to him or you continue to trust in your own wisdom and your own ways refusing God's counsel hardening your heart these are diverging pathways that have consequences now and in eternity. Look at verse 28. I can't imagine much more terrifying things than verse 28. They will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. In our day and age, we always assume... God's always there for us. Whenever I need him, I can just call him. He's a God of love. He'll understand. At any time, I can just reach out to him and he'll be there for me. He'll understand. He'll forgive me. He'll receive me back. But there is a coming a time when that will no longer be true. Think of the student who refuses to study for an exam, who refuses to have the discipline of setting aside time to study and to learn properly and to memorize good things. And the day of the exam comes. What happens to that student? The student cries out, Wisdom, I need you now. Wisdom, I need your help. Help me in this exam, but help me now. That's the same idea here. They will call upon me, verse 28, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but it will be too late. They will not find me. 
Listen to these words of Jonathan Edwards, this fiery preacher who laid out the terrifying consequences of ultimately rejecting God and facing God's judgment. I'll give you a short extract from his sermon, The Justice of God in the Damnation of Sinners. Listen to what Edward says. To help your conception of what hell is, imagine yourself to be cast into a fiery oven or into a great furnace where your pain would be greater than if you touched a coal of fire. Imagine also that your body were to lie there for a quarter of an hour, full of fire, and all the while fully conscious. What horror would you feel at the entrance of such a furnace? And how long would that quarter of an hour seem to you? If it were to be measured by the hourglass, how long would the glass seem to be running? And after you had endured it for one minute, how unbearable would it be to you to think that you had yet to endure the other 14 minutes? But what would be the effect on your soul if you knew you must lie there enduring that torment for the full 24 hours? And how much greater would be the effect if you knew you must endure it for a whole year? And how vastly greater still if you knew you must endure it for a thousand years? Oh, then how would your heart sink if you thought, if you knew that you must bear it forever and ever, that there would be no end, that after millions of millions of ages, your torment would be no nearer to an end than it ever was, and that you would never, never be delivered. That's the ultimate, terrifying, tragic consequence of rejecting wisdom. You can see why the author has put it right in the middle of this chiastic structure here. It's the focus. Look at verse 29 as we come out of the chiastic structure. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Verse 31. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. The person that says, I want to live my own way. I want to do things my way, make my own choices, decide what's right and what's wrong in my own eyes. That person will eat the fruit of their own way. They will have the fill of their own devices. Friends, remember this. God is not mocked. You reap what you sow, right? You can't just live a life that says, I'm going to decide how I live. I'm going to decide which part of God's word I obey and which I disobey and how I think God will accept me and won't accept me. I'm going to make my own choices, but I'll be fine at the end. God will understand. We'll be okay. Me and God, we've got an arrangement. He understands. Proverbs says here, God is not mocked. Don't be deceived. The fruit of your own way, you will one day eat. You will have the fill of your own devices. We see this all through Proverbs, this law of consequences. Your character leads to your conduct, leads to consequences. In other words, it's a chain. It always follows that direction. The character who you are, your core beliefs, who you understand God to be, your convictions about God and your, your convictions about Scripture, all of that, your character, leads to your conduct, what you do, what you say, what you don't do. And all of those things have consequences. All of those things have consequences. We cannot escape those consequences. Listen to, remember the story about Jesus? When Jesus was was telling a story about Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16. Lazarus and the rich man, both of them die and enter into eternity. And Jesus says these words in Luke 16, verse 29. Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And the rich man said, 
No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will then repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. These things you have on your head are so important. Listening to God's word, listening to wisdom, there is nothing more important than that. We've seen wisdom's call, wisdom's warning. Now let's see wisdom's blessing. Wisdom's blessing. Look at verse 32. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. The author rounds up this small section here by saying, the simple or the mockers or the fools, these people are not just mildly hurt or inconvenienced. Look at what verse 32 says. The simple are killed by their turning away. Wisdom isn't just a a nice to have for an easier life. God's wisdom is a matter of life and death. The simple are killed by their turning away. And the complacency of fools destroys them. Isn't that amazing? We have this, uh, we have this notion of, well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just sit quiet and just do my own thing and I won't, I won't bother anyone. I won't uh, interfere with anyone's business. I'll just be quiet. I'll just be complacent and lazy and I just won't do anything. Look at what happens to the fool who says that in verse 32. The complacency of fools destroys them. These are serious consequences. But look at the contrast in verse 33. This blessing for those who listen to wisdom. Verse 33. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure, will be at ease without dread of disaster. What a breath of fresh air after this Weighty, weighty few verses here. The one who listens to wisdom, the one who listens to God's word and acts upon it, three things will happen here in verse 33. Firstly, they will dwell secure. If you listen to God's word and you put it into practice and you obey it, you will dwell secure. You will be at ease, secondly. You'll be at ease. There'll be nothing that ultimately ruffles your feathers. You will be at ease and you will have peace now and in eternity. Thirdly, without dread of disaster. Without dread of disaster because you know that one day your Lord will come back and take you to be with Him. Picture picture a school classroom and a headmaster storms in the door you can see something's bothering him and he is angry someone has been disobedient and there are consequences that are coming down on some students amongst all those students which will be the ones that are at ease secure without dread of disaster which ones the ones who have listened right the ones who have obeyed the ones who are on the pathway of righteousness. But for those who have disobeyed, for those who have ignored instruction and wisdom, they will be terrified of the consequences. Verse 33, if you listen to wisdom, if you listen to God's word, you'll dwell secure. You'll be at ease. Picture picture Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside these still waters. He refreshes my soul. That will happen to you now as you decide and you, as, you, as you commit yourself to following wisdom. It will happen now and it will happen in eternity in a fuller, ultimate sense. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 This is the promise that you can hold on to. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. 
then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. That should give you great hope. That should give you great courage. That should help you to be at ease and to dwell secure without dread of disaster because you know that one day the Lord will come back and take you to be with Him. Leave you with these words from Hebrews 3, verse 12. Again, the author here pleading for us to listen and to not let those words go in the one ear and straight out the other ear. Hebrews 3, 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you can see thoughts and intentions and hard motives. You can see right into our hearts and minds, even right now. Lord Jesus, I pray for your mercy and your grace. I pray that you would pour out your mercy on those who are on a pathway to destruction and everlasting damnation. I pray that you would grant a change of heart, a new heart, a heart of flesh that longs to obey you and to please you rather than our own flesh. I pray, Father, that there would be no one here today upon which these consequences fall on. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your amazing grace toward us. Thank you for the wisdom that you've given us, even in the book of Proverbs. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.